My name is Michael Le Chevalier, and I'm a PhD candidate in religious ethics over at the University of Chicago. Um, and with Deborah Erickson, uh, I'm happy to welcome you here today. We both organized this panel. Um, I also especially want to welcome uh, members of Elstein's family who've actually joined us here today. Um, it's really fitting that we are gathered here for this round table as this year marks the fifth anniversary of Jean Bethke Elstein's death. Um, she was buried at Fort Collins, Colorado. And when colleagues, mentors, friends, or even loyal critics and fierce interlocutors pass, it is we who remain who get to take up the task of evaluating what they left behind. It's also fitting that we engage with Elstein's work here in Denver, Colorado. We are within driving distance of the small town of Windsor, where Elstein was born, and Tinmath, the village, as she called it, where she grew up. And it was interesting years ago looking through her bio because Tinmath always was followed by this curious parenthetical note, population 185. With this declaration of 185, she was identifying it as one of the many small towns that she defends in her work. At 185 people, it would qualify, I imagine, as among those landscapes one seeks out, um, she writes, one that not necessarily is always warm and friendly, but rather one that is recognizably human, that has discernible form and scale, and invites us to inhabit and engage it, she writes in Real Politics, page 320. With, with this parenthetical, Tinmath appears untouched by the sprawl and growth that now characterized it, characterizes it, fixed as an anchor for her moral imagination. For Elstein, it is in the village, or rather, it is what is made possible in this type of place, a place where one can know one's neighbors, that she locates the real stuff of politics. It's also in Tinmath where Elstein developed her love of films, sneaking into Ingrid Bergman's Joan of Arc and later cutting off her hair to model after her childhood hero. It was there where she was first struck, where she was struck with polio and turned her attention to books, relying upon the Tinmath's bookmobile, a mobile library that serviced small communities to explore the war, the war writings of journalist Ernie Pyle Abraham Lincoln, and so many others. Elstein attended public schools in Colorado and graduated from Colorado State University in 1963, transgressing already the public-private divide that she would later write about as she brought her kids in tow to class. She pursued a PhD in 1973 from Brandeis University in political theory and became the public speaker, prolific writer, mentor, professor, and teacher at the University of Massachusetts, at Amherst, at Vanderbilt University, and later at the University of Chicago, where she taught from 1995 until her death. In the midst of her teaching career, Elstein's research moved in multiple directions, unconstrained by tradition or disciplinary boundaries, addressing themes like feminism and the family, democracy and civil society, religion, theology, and politics, and international relations and just war. Yet even these broad themes do not completely cover her career as an academic and public intellectual, which also included forays into bioethics, political commentary, and pop culture. 2018 also marks the publication of the first book of secondary literature devoted to Elstein's work, Jean Bethke Elstein, Politics, Ethics, and Society. You can find it at the University of Notre Dame press table with a generous discount. It comprises of essays by scholars like Francis Fuku Fukuyama, Michael Walzer, Lisa Cahill, and two of our panelists here today. It seeks to both critically engage with the broad themes that Elstein wrote on and to point out new directions, extending many of the conversations to which she contributed in her career. This panel, in many respects, is an extension of the conversations sparked in that book. And we've set the, before the panel the challenging task of evaluating Elstein's work now that her canon is closed. We are joined today by former friends, colleagues, interlocutors, and students of Elstein. Victor Anderson is the Oberlin Theological School Professor of Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt University 
the Divinity School, African American and Diaspora Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences. He has served on the editorial boards of the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, the Journal of Religion, the American Journal of Theology and Philosophy, and is author of three books, Beyond Ontological Blackness, an essay on African American religious and cultural criticism, Pragmatic Theology, Negotiating the Intersections of an American Philosophy of Religion and Public Theology, and Creative Exchange, a Constructive Theology of African American Religious Experience. He has re recently completed an edited volume with Dr. Lewis B. Baldwin entitled, Revives My Soul Again, The Spirituality of Martin Luther King with Fortress Press. James Turner Johnson is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Religion at Rutgers University. His research and teaching have focused principally on the historical development and application of the Western and Islamic moral traditions related to war, peace, and the practice of statecraft. He is the author of 11 books, of which the most recent is Sovereignty, Moral and Historical Perspectives with Georgetown Press, an editor or co-editor of six or more of which the most recent with Eric Patterson is the Ashgate Research Companion to Military Ethics. Robin Lovin is the Kerry McGuire University Professor of Ethics Emeritus at Southern Methodist University and a visiting scholar in theology at Loyola University, Chicago. He joined the Southern Methodist University faculty in 1994 and served as Dean of Perkins School of Theology from 1994 to 2002. Prior to this, he was Dean of the Theological School at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, and a member of the faculty at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. His most recent books are Christian Realism and the New Realities and an Introduction to Christian Ethics. He has also written extensively on religion and law and comparative religious ethics. He is an ordained minister of the United Methodist Church and teaches regularly at the Russian, uh, Russia United Methodist Theological Seminary in Moscow. Charles Matthews is the Carolyn M. Barber Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia and a senior fellow at UVA's Miller Center of Public Affairs. He was educated at Georgetown University and the University of Chicago and is the author of Evil and the August Augustinian Tradition and A Theology of Public Life, among other books. He's currently co-directing a major grant from the Henry Luce Foundation on religion and its publics. And finally, responding to this panel is Deborah Erickson, philosophy instructor at Bloomsburg University. She regularly writes and presents on issues ranging from environmental ethics to ethics in the academy. She is also co-editor of Jean Beth Gelstein, Politics, Ethics, and Society. Um, we are going to first have all of our presenters offer their remarks, allow for some discussion um, uh, in response to Deborah's remarks amidst the panel, and then we'll turn uh, to Q&A here, and you can see um, the microphones over here. So at, at, um, at a certain point, I will invite people to join us for question and answer. Um, right now, please join me in welcoming Victor Anderson. I told Michael that's what Gene would have done. <laughs> I'm going to start by just saying there's a gospel song that says, I don't know why Jesus loved me, but I'm glad he did. I don't know why Jean loved me, but she did. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm repentant liberal progressive, and she knew it, and we had a lot of fun uh, back and forth with each other. So I hope my remarks actually reflect the kinds of, of friendship we had in disagreeing with each other. <laughs> Seeing is believing, so the saying goes. It also goes for visions of more order, whether from the village of Tenneth, Colorado, from where Elshane caught the vision for more order, or from the south side of Chicago, where I caught a vision for a rooted cosmopolitanism. Our different experiences had determined effects on our construals of the more ordering of our social and political lives. From different experiences come different visions and different moralities. More theorists also tend to evaluate one another's moralities temperamentally. This too is projected from our different moral experiences. So if philosophy is as much a tone of voice as is what is said, then a tone of voice, tones of voice, through which we articulate our descriptions, analysis, evaluation, judgments, 
of political and moral concerns also matters. They reflect something of the felt qualities, the affects, the inclination, dispositions, the subjectivities, not only of the communities from which our visions of moral order are cultivated, but also the passions and weight of convictions we give to them. Elstein and I, and I had complete agreement on these formal <laughs> statements, yet we were moral worlds apart in our descriptions, analysis, evaluations, and judgments of the moral political culture we inhabited. In my writings, I could no more proceed any more than Elstein could in the way of moral descriptions without acknowledging the debt owed to my moral upbringing. Mine was a solid, solidly black, thoroughly urban, lower middle class neighborhood with large schools, high crime, gang infested, police, con police controlled, church mediated, mixed family structured, and politically liberal progressive civil rights guided polity. Rights talk, which Elstein was deeply critical of, community organizing, balancing, competing claims, ameliorating differences, reaching consensus, and mobilizing for actions were critical to the common good of my community. From her moral optics, Elstein might well find my ethical polity way too thin, a basis for founding a substitute vision for the moral ordering of an ethical polity. And this is just what she offered for public consideration in her life and works. Namely, prospects for a thicker, more substantive, effective filial ground for an ethical polity. Elstein was a communal, communal village morality, different from my liberal cosmopolitan morality. Almost every commentator discussing the life and work of Elstein starts with the village. This was a paramount symbol of her moral optics. Through its lens, she looked out onto the political landscape of our times. She talked mimetically about two villages. The one was Tinef, Colorado, the other, the village of the mind. Remembering Austin, William Gillespie writes, some people are shaped by the places they come from in indelible ways. Their ethos becomes the ethics and defines their character, unquote. Casting Elstein's life in imaginary of the Great Plains, he turns to the Plains stories which uh, center on the immigrants who came from the Great Plains and were shaped by the land and their struggles to survive and build a life for themselves, their families, and members of their community, unquote. Gillespie saw Elstein as, I quote him, easily characterizing these immigrant Plains people, commenting, her experience growing up upon the plains gave her the courage and resilience to become a pioneer in many different academic fields, unquote. The editors of this great and monumental book in uh, Celebration of Elstein also make Elstein's growing up in the village of Tineth a pivotal starting point for much of their, what has been said and written about her life, politics, ethics, faith, and moral temperament. Whether real or imagined, her village was a place of safety, cooperation, nurture, and care. This imaginary formed her moral optics, giving a sensitive shape to her moral and political expectations of basic social institutions, the family, religion, and governance. Elstein's village located values and expectations which she demanded of a democratic ethical polity, namely to ensure democratic tranquility, security, and protection. While showing a rather guarded estim estimation of governance, Elstein extolled the family and church highly. Jane Mansbridge suggests, and I quote, Elstein may have thought about the family the way she reported once feeling about the Catholic Church. It is something that is always there. One secure point of reference in a fragmented and apparently random world, unquote. Quoting Elstein, she writes, I know what to expect of the church in a time of pervasive despair. They are hungry to be fed, trembling to be clothed, homeless to be housed, frightened to be comforted. Mansfield concludes, this is what she also expected of the family. In the end, it was also what she expected of a just government and a hegemonic power on the world stage, unquote. In Augustine, the limits of politics, Elstein medically extends the more ethos of the village to the life of the mind in its contours, writing, and I quote her at length, 
My village is more likable because a humbler place. It has boundaries, of course, but it extends hospitality to all strangers, wandering pilgrims, to the lost, the forlorn, the bold, and the timid. It's a rather simpler place, the village of the mind, but it is a human landscape, a site within which beings such as ourselves enact daily and small gestures of kindness and trust and care and speaking out for fair treatment that are just the stuff of lived life. Because that is not all the, that beings such as ourselves do, the village also has its share of malicious gossip and backbiting and pettiness and scandal because people have to live and work together. None of this is codified into rival adversarial sites or camps. They understand what it means to tend to the quotidian. They understand forgiveness. Elstein's village optics looks on the world outside the village with a robust pessimism. One not filled with laughter like as Nietzsche espoused, but hers was a pessimism filled with lament. She was in good company with many communitarian narrative political theorists and public theologians and intellectuals concerned with the threatening shape which rights talk, identity politics, perceived rabid individualism, consumerism, and popular culture were determining our contemporary moral and political culture. Seen from Elstein's village optics, our highest ideals are reduced to particular individual and personal interests. Our shared life is jeopardized by totalizing group interests, private venture, and autonomous decision making, controlling the private sphere of family, marriage, sexuality, reproduction, and childcare. Even when she critiqued public policy, technology, and genetics, she tended to do so with these concerns being first in her mind. Elstein lamented the erosion of American civil society and its mediating gardens, as she called them, which I quote her. Located the child, for example, in his or her little estate, the family, which was itself nested within a wider overlapping framework of sustaining and supporting civic institutions, churches, schools, and solidaristic organizations such as unions and mothers association, unquote. Her village gardens were, and I quote her again, a honeycombed vast network that offered a densely textured social ecology for the growing citizen, unquote. The family was most representative of this garden. It is the morally, politically generative social deposit, as she called it, that gave concrete formation, and I quote her, of intergenerational trust, neighborliness, and civic responsibility. The family further offered an ideal metaphor for the cultivation of democratic spirit and piety which were being threatened by regimented assaults on marriage and the family. Martha Eccles, Eccleberg and Shanley write, and I quote them, Elstein's increasing fear that the values of reciprocity, responsibility, and love that characterized family life at its best were in severe jeopardy. She had little truck for what she labeled family-like institutions as distinct from marital families. It did not seem to credit the possibility that gay parents could develop the same sort of intergenerational ties that characterized her idealized heterosexual family. Other thinkers who worried about the erosion of the institutions of civil society and with, and with it any communal ground for cultivating civic virtue joined Elstein. By them, no doubt, my liberal cosmopolitan morality would be certainly judged thin, abstract, calculating, structural, and yes, clean, rights guided. Of course, they would be only partially right. And I may find Elshin's village morality overly thick and prioritizing the traditional conception of marriage and family. And just as Elshin saw intolerance and ridicule and the tones of voice of those who disagreed with her on these matters, her own moral tone of voice hardly displayed contours of the village mind she espoused, namely humbleness, hospitality to all strangers, wanderings, pilgrims, the lost, forlorn, the bold, the timid, 
kindness, trust, and care. One commentator says, when it came to ethics that matters, our state's moral tone of voice and temperament, they have friends and critics to see someone forthright, unswerving, uncompromising, tough, at times combative, exhilarating the strain of heroic and tragic, and undeterred by hostile destructors. I have to admit, my friends, that's the G that I met and I loved. <laughs> like so many others, I too appreciated not only Elstein's candor, but experienced her nurturing and mentoring of students and young scholars. In the end, our more disagreements on matters for which we both saw so much at stake were in the end not really reducible to thinner or thicker moralities, but whether there was enough openness and graciousness to embrace a generous pluralism without the need of forgiveness. Thank you. And please join me in welcoming to the stage James Turner Johnson. Good morning. I first met, <clears throat> I first met Jean Elstein when she and I were both invited to present papers at a conference at Chaminade University of Honolulu in November of 1987. Her book, Women in War, had just been published earlier that same year, while uh, my Can Modern War Be Just had appeared in 1984. Both of us by that time had other books to our credit, but the conference organizers expected us to take account of these most recent works in our presentations, and that we did. Because of our overlapping interests, Jean and I continued to cross paths and at subsequent conferences, and a relationship grew between us that continued to develop until our untimely death in 2013. I remember specific moments especially. She included an article of mine as a chapter in her 1991 edited book, Just War Theory, and we worked closely together on a project to stimulate dialogue between American and Arab intellectuals in the wake of the terrorist attacks of, attacks of, 19, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, of 2011. Finally, I was one of those invited to present a paper at the last of the conferences on her work, sponsored by the McDonald Foundation at the University of Chicago Divinity School. My subject there was what was left unsaid between our work, despite its overall thematic similarity. And I was looking forward to a conversation with, to, with her on this, a conversation that was, alas, not to be. You're invited to read what I said in the book, uh, of the paper that I gave there and the book that uh, uh, Michael and, uh, and Deborah edited, as well as the other essays in this provoking book. But today, while I'll talk about the same major theme of our differences and what fell between us, my focus will be on different aspects of this theme. Mike and Deborah, in organizing this panel, asked each of us on the panel to talk about, among other things, what Jean got right and what she got wrong. I think that for me, what is important is the differences that I will be talking about today and the ones that I focused on in my paper for the Chicago Conference, which appears in the book that Mike and Deborah edited on the basis of those conferences on Jean's work. I have too much respect for her work to be ready to label any of it wrong. Rather, I think what is important about it is the perspective she brought in selecting and treating the issues she dealt with in her scholarship, as well as what wisdom we may adapt to con uh, changing circumstances from her judgments. Those judgments, scholarly, moral, political, and otherwise. Jean and I were certainly different in how we approached particular court, uh, issues in our relationship, uh, in our scholarship, notably the, one, the ones where our work had the most in common. 
how to think about the nature and meaning of just war and of sovereignty. Despite this difference of approaches, my respect for her, her work and the memory that remains uh, of the closeness of our relationship keeps me from labeling her approach wrong. Rather, my interest is still to think about the value to be found in her perspective. Her scholarship and mine were in fundamental ways mirror images, as is seen in our respective approaches to the two subjects we treated in common, just war and sovereignty. On just war, I have been interested in the details of how the just war idea came into being and developed historically. My focus has been to look at the details, hoping to identify the most important ones and discern their interconnections, so as to get to the truth of what ought to count as just war thinking and its implications in contemporary contexts, where one finds a proliferation of conceptions, <clears throat> conceptions of just war and different kinds of meaning drawn out of these conceptions. Some of these competing conceptions I regard as well and truly wrong. Um, others among those competing conceptions I appreciate for what they offer, though I wish they had uh, sought to use the historical foundations, development, and application of the just war idea more fully. Among these latter, I group the conceptions laid out by Paul Ramsey, Michael Walzer, and of course, Jean Betgalstein. As for Jean's and my very different books on sovereignty, my interest was, as with just war tradition, to carry out a detailed historical excavation and extrapolate from the meanings found there, getting from that to the matter of sovereign responsibility today and in any time. Jean's approach to both these topics, just war and sovereignty, was instead to identify major themes and concentrate on drawing them out. On just war, I find her, in her work evidence of the influence of both Walzer and Ramsey, though while she cites Walzer in Just War Against Terror, for example, she doesn't cite Ramsey there. The connection I see really between her thinking about just war and Ramsey's may have more to do with their similarity of thinking uh, on this topic in terms of its Augustinian Christian roots, or indeed their similar ways of thinking about and using Augustine in defining their own conceptions of just war. On sovereignty, she was clearly more concerned than I with the religious element capsulated in the idea of the sovereignty of God, where my focus was on the way medieval scholars, to be sure Christian clergy, adapted and used the conception of natural law drawn from Roman law and culture. To put the difference between, differences between us simply, my approach is to work from the bottom up, from the details of what can be found by historical investigations, while hers was to work from the top down, from identifying general phenomena and ideas spread across a culture or the thinking of a particular figure, then explore and apply these to provide meaning in our own political and historical context. I said earlier that our different ways of working were effectively mirror images of each other. And this can be seen also in our intellectual development. She began as a political theorist, interested in a specific historical figure, Alexis de Tocqueville, and moved from there incre increasingly towards exploring Christian ethics and religion. I, on the other hand, began in the field of Christian ethics and moral uh, thinking and moved from there increasingly towards political themes and historical method. Our origins matter in both cases, and in Jean's, it is her lifelong connection to Tocqueville that, to me, stands out as the guiding clue to the nature of her scholarship. When one reads Democracy in America, one encounters a search for overarching themes that can be used for moral, political, and social profit. In Tocqueville's words, quote, 
My wish in my effort to describe democracy in America has been to find there instruction by which we may ourselves profit. I confess that in America, I saw more than America. I sought there the image of democracy itself with its inclinations, its character, its prejudices, and its passions. In just war against terror, this approach led Jean to, uh, to take us on a focus on justice and the Christian responsibility to serve it in the political community. In this, she was at very much in contrast with so many contemporary just war thinkers whose only use of the idea of just war is to find ways to limit any use of armed force. This was not high on Jean's list of priorities. Tocqueville's words could, all, could serve as the description of her approach to scholarship, but one also thinks of Reinhold Niebuhr's conception of justice as that which leads towards the idea of the kingdom of God. It always must do so, though it never may achieve that goal. We are always on the way, and what matters in the wisdom to be found in particular forms like just war and sovereignty is how we should act in the meantime to serve the ideal sought. Now this approach carries with it the caution that one always needs to be open to revisiting the particular conclusions reached in a given context. And this fits well with another of my endeavorous questions to us presenters. What is worth revisiting? My answer to this is any and all of it is worth revisiting, both for the continuing wisdom to be found there and to rethink what is found to fit new contexts and questions as these develop. This is not, though, a particular answer to Jean's work, though I think that her methodology and that of Tocqueville intentionally opens the door to this. But I would give the same answer to the purpose of scholarship generally. We scholars do not do our job unless we are continually open to revision and growth. Jean filled a certain kind of role in her work in that as her career developed, for various reasons, she became a public intellectual, one who worked on the borders between scholarship for its own sake and its implications for public life and the course of the nation as mapped out by policy and governmental decisions. Her coming into this role means that, especially towards the end of her career, she should be viewed as not only a scholar. This role gave her a kind of public presence and a kind of influence that others uh, in the academic community will never achieve, although some of us may nibble at it more closely than others. It also, <clears throat> it also gave her a respect for the responsibility that political leaders bear and a hope to influence this responsibility. To take the measure of how well the influence of a public intellectual endures requires taking a long view, much longer than we have here, not judging it narrowly by one's immediate context. There may, though, need to be a substantial change in the nature of our national political discourse before there is room once again for the public influence of such a person as Jean Betke Elstein, though her scholarship endures in its own right. Thanks. <laughs> um, please join me in welcoming Robin Levin to the podium. Well, unlike our first two speakers, I really can't begin by defining a field of disagreement with uh, Jean and, and my own work. 
I think we always perceived ourselves as very close together. Certainly she was generous enough on, on several occasions to say that she thought we shared a common understanding of the basic principles of politics. Of course, she also believed that those principles uh, justified the invasion of Iraq. Uh, and I remember saying at several points during uh, that period in our history that I hope she was wrong about at least one of those two ideas, that, that we shared this common ideas and that they justified the, the invasion. I think what Jean and I had in common, uh, and, and it's echoed certainly in what uh, uh, both uh, Victor and Jim have said, is this Augustinian perspective that lies behind her understanding of politics. I keep coming back to Augustine and the limits of politics. Uh, someday uh, we, we should do a whole session of several hours on that uh, book and its key idea uh, about, about the limits of what you can accomplish in politics, about the idea that political solutions to problems are always temporary, partial, and limited by the narrowness of our own vision. Jean learned that both from her own experience and from Augustine. She discovered in Augustine that what her intuitions taught her was also deeply rooted in the Christian tradition. And that in our time, the deficiencies of our own politics become more and more apparent as we, read, as we see that politics against that tradition and that background. We need to read Jean again to learn how to ground ourselves in that Augustinian view of history and deal with the limits of politics as we experience it today. In one way, what confronts us in Augustine and in Elstein is an account of politics that is profoundly pessimistic. Augustine's sharp contrast between the city of God and the earthly city warns us against thinking too highly of ourselves or expecting too much from our leaders. Augustine never allows his eschatological certainty that history is leading us toward the city of God to underwrite some kind of Eusebian notion that the Roman Empire is going to be the vehicle that gets us there. And while Augustine, the Neoplatonist, sometimes seemed to share Plato's assumptions that reason can know the good in some absolute sense, Augustine, the Christian pastor, never expects that our misguided wills are going to do what our reason tells us uh, we ought. We don't fail at this because we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. We don't fail at it because we're so unfortunate as to have bad leaders who can't carry out God's plan as clearly as we see it. Nor should we rest our hopes on a politics that succeeds by, uh, how shall I put it, building a wall between the city of God and the earthly city. For the distinction between the city of God and the earthly city, while it is ultimately of great interest, is a distinction such that we can't be sure at present who belongs on which side of the wall. Any answer that tempts us to distinguish one group of people from another tempts us to think that we could solve the problems of politics by changing or eliminating somebody who is not us. We can discern the real limits of politics only by recognizing that whatever the problem is, we are always part of it. The limits of politics are written into our human nature. But, Augustine and Elstein don't then say what we might expect them to say next. <clears throat> Augustine does not say the world is a, of human society is a fragmented and violent place where there are no goods worth having and you should turn away from that as quickly as possible to the commonwealth of the heavenly city which is the only place where you may expect any real good. Instead, 
Augustine says that there is a good to be sought in human society. And he even encourages Christians to seek it at some cost to themselves. The good that's available to earthly society is peace, which all people are united in wanting even when they go to war and even when their political talents extend no further than the coordinating efforts of a band of thieves. In a true commonwealth, of course, peace would be lasting because love would be united on an object that would not change and could not be lost. <coughs> but that's not the kind of peace to which Augustine thinks the human society he sees about him can aspire. What our politics can produce is a peace for the time being, a peace in which people are united by the sharing of limited goods, sustained in a shared effort that for the moment overcomes their skepticism about each other's motives. Those are the limits of politics we learn from Augustine, and much of Jean Elstein's work was about encouraging contemporary Christians to live within those limits. Perhaps I should even say rejoice in those limits. For Jean Elstein clearly loved this work in all of the public forums that she was part of, in the daily life of institutions, and in encouraging her students in the work that they were doing beyond the academy. She was interested, as she said, in how, this is a quote from her, how our work in small ways and about small things contributes to the overall harshness or decency of any social order. These achievements are the results of compromise and second thoughts and partial successes, and we know that the good we do depends on those compromises with the wills of other people and the compromises with our own ignorance. We learn in experience that we have to be satisfied with that. Only those who have little or no experience of real politics feel what John Rawls once called the zeal to embody the whole truth in politics. What we seek is peace, limited goals of limited duration achieved by compromises that only partially solve the problems. Limited goals, limited decisions, compromises put in place by people who will have to make those same decisions all over again. And if they don't have to be made again by us, they're going to have to be made by those who come after us. That's the nature of politics limited as Augustine and Elstein saw it. This politics within limits has to be defended not just against those who want to withdraw from the human city and wait for God's plan, but for much of the past century, the task of limited politics has been to defend that work in small ways and about small things against ideologies that told us that we don't have to limit ourselves to small things, that this Augustinian peace is not enough, that we could make a choice that would reshape the future once and for all. Choose the race, choose the nation, choose the revolution, and you won't have to make any more choices. That the, the, was the worry of the 20th century, and Elstein and others were very good at articulating Augustine's sense of the limits of politics against that. But I wonder if today our task is not slightly different, to worry less about those who think Augustine's politics offers too little and begin to pay attention to those who are telling us that peace for the time being is really too much to expect. People who go to work in small ways about small things, people who, who do all their politics in that village environment that we've, we've been talking about, undertake that difficult task because they're seeking genuine human goods. They believe 
that a society that figures out how to share those goods will be a society at peace, at least for the time being. But those who would pursue this Augustinian limited politics are increasingly being drowned out by those for who uh, there are no, they're being drowned out by those for whom there is no peace but only winners and losers. And when you look at it that way, the time being is swallowed up in an immediate now for which there is no history because nothing determines our choices apart from our own interest. And there is no future because the only consequences that matter are the ones that we will experience for ourselves. As these voices become more insistent, it's going to be necessary for the heirs of Augustine and Elstein to make a case for the ongoing search for limited goods that are shared among people who have created a peace for themselves for the time being. But this will not be a realistic politics of lowered expectations. Increasingly, the idea of peace for the time being is a politics of aspiration. And I think it's important that we do aspire to it and not just withdraw into communities where we can tell each other stories about the city of God. For though we may realize a larger good in more complete ways in that city, for the time of this life, it is this piece of small things and shared goods that makes us human. Please join me in welcoming Charles Matthews to the podium. I uh, was uh, one of Jean's students uh, several years ago. And um, in best grade grubbing way, let me say that I want to start by saying I'm delighted that no one has noted that today is the 155th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address a text that Jean loved dearly and we talked about repeatedly, although I think we both agree that the second inaugural is actually a better piece of work. Um, let me also say that I've been on a number of panels honoring people, but I think um, Michael and Deborah got this right, that Jean was unique in being the kind of person who would have wanted a panel on what she got right and what she got wrong. I think the idea that she was interested in the argument um, and the conversation that would go forward always strikes me as a, a distinctive part of what Jean was, who she was, and uh, something we, we can uh, carry forward. Um, when I was her student, uh, once we had a conversation that prompted my paper in some ways, in the mid-90s, and she was angry about something the Clinton administration or somebody in American government was doing, and there was a little pause and she said, the thing is, we won't get these years back. We are in a unique position now, and we will not get these years back. History will come for us again. And it, it feels to me like that was one of the lessons that Jean was always trying in her, her urgencies to give us. And I always wonder if, I always think about that um, most days. In book one of uh, the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, Aristotle begins his criticism of Plato with uh, the re reasonably famous statement that we honor Plato uh, not by simply honoring Plato, but by honoring the truth that Plato pursued. Jean Bethke Elstein was not Plato, and I am definitely not Aristotle. But I think that um, that would be an attitude that she would accept as well. My thoughts today are really in that interest. When Jean Elstein died, a number of those who noted her death on the web and elsewhere suggested that she had long outlasted her best years. Too bad she hadn't died a decade or more before, in 2000, or at least 2001, they said, before she became a defender of the George Bush administration or an apologist for torture. But really, they implied, she was part of a moment in history that had definitively passed. As part of the generation of anti, anti, anti liberals who clustered around the New Republic in the 1990s, one of those who complained, sometimes sneered, these uh, critics said, 
at those who defended the core ideas of liberalism against those who essentially attacked it. Elstein was of a certain post-1960s worldview and in some important ways unintelligible outside of it. When Irene died on September 11th, 2001, her moment had passed, or so those critics said. Well, you may not be interested in the dialectic, but the dialectic is most definitely interested in you. And while our world is certainly different from the worlds that Elstein knew, and also uh, the critics of her inhabited, um, our world still has echoes and resonances with the world that she had. It's different, in fact, from all of those worlds in ways that none of them could have foreseen, so that many of her critics are as much at sea today as she ever would have been. So perhaps now that the topsoil of history has been turned over several times, we can see better what is durable in Elstein's work. And what I want to propose is that Elstein's thought partly equips us for facing some of the most basic and pressing challenges of today, and also partly in its very failures teaches us lessons about how to address those things better. Consider this. While we face a number of interlocking challenges, overlapping crises today, I'd say that we have two distinct uh, areas of uh, problematic uh, concern. And Elstein has something partial to say to both of them. One crisis is what I can call the crisis of liberal institutions. By this I mean the large-scale crisis of commitment to institutions in the liberal world, the world that Kant imagined with remarkable perspicacity and perpetual peace. That world, imagined in the 18th century, but largely really constructed in the 20th century and really in the post-World War II era of the 20th century, seems today threatened by corrosion from within and subtle insidious assault from without. That attack is crucially fueled from the outside, both by fundamentally illiberal forces of political authoritarianism, such as Russia and the People's Republic of China, eager to encourage this liberal world's self-destruction and actively seeking to do so, and also indirectly and sometimes directly by deeply illiberal structures of global capitalism, corporations, and finance which are actually enabled and created by these very, the very liberal internationalism, which they necessarily, I think, also in part structurally oppose. That's one kind of crisis, the crisis of institutions. We see this being discussed in a lot of especially political commentary today. The other crisis we face, not unrelated to the above, obviously, is what we can call the crisis of pluralism. For a number of reasons, humanity is currently churning together at a rate not only never before seen, not only never before imagined, but really never before possible. The global reach of liberal capitalism, with its uh, per unprecedented migratory flows of labor, has caused population changes where populations had mo been mostly the same for hundreds or even thousands of years. These changes throw up new configurations of difference, which people in these areas, new arrivals as much as old ones, have to confront. This is a matter of ideological difference, to be sure, but also religious and, above all, I would say, uh, sexual and gender and racial and ethnic differences. And it's most immediately the struggle with white supremacy in the United States, uh, which currently consumes our politics. It's worth our while, and this is a good gene moment, it seems to me, to step back and recognize how radical a change this rising pluralism is for our species as a whole and how likely it is that this challenge is far more profound and durable than we have yet recognized. Consider in a kind of quasi-Aristotelian way this sort of just-so-natural history. For most of our history, Homo sapiens has seemed to live in small communities of intimate kin groups with around 300 to 500 people, each of which with its own different language, culture, and way of living, each of which kept well clear of all others. But since the agricultural revolution about 11,000 years ago, and then since the rise of axial age religions 25 to 2,000 years ago, we've been combining together in ever larger configurations, sharing common languages, common social structures, common belief systems that have forced us to find our tendencies toward separatism and suspicion more akin to apartheid than a judicious respect or prudent indifference. It's also worth our while to see how the crises of pluralism and of liberal institutions powerfully interact. As the contemporary political theorist Jan Werner Müller suggests in his What is Populism, 
One of the most central features of the populism currently raging throughout much of the world is a hostility to pluralism and a resentment at politics, conceived, as Robin was saying, as a give and take form of bargaining between individuals and groups as they negotiate their power relations. So understood, populism requires pluralism, ironically, as it needs an other against which to define itself, and it also needs structures of liberal institutions which enable the politics that it wants, therefore, to complain about and generate resentment against. So Merler says that, in fact, populism is an inevitable shadow of pluralistic liberal democratic societies such as the ones we hopefully still inhabit and I would want us to say aspire to inhabit for the coming centuries. Jean Bethke Elstein had a partial vision of both these challenges. But I think that her work was interestingly too sensitive to her American academic context at times to see the full shape of them as they developed both in the US and around the world. Ironically, her work was hampered by her annoyance at potential allies, especially the second generation Rawlsians who surrounded her. She saw the institutional crisis only as its evidence failed to be articulable in the dominant liberalism's aphasia about Burkean institutions, it seems to me most of all famously the family. And she saw the challenges of pluralism largely, though not exclusively, under the similar failure of the dominant liberalism's narrow-minded secularism. Now she was right about both of these failings, okay? And the realization of this is visible in the way that after she said these things, the work of Sabah Mahmood um, in Politics of Piety and the work of Robert Putnam in Bowling Alone both garnered enormous support for these two facts about our world. But in her annoyance, she focused her attention more at her colleagues in the academy than at the challenges of real forms of ugliness and menace that we collectively face. She thought the dominant liberalism could not and would not learn. I would argue that in the past couple decades, it has in fact learned. Consider as an example her worries about religious liberty. Her warnings were prescient but I would argue more prescient about how the category would be weaponized by religious conservatives who have convinced themselves that they are about to be persecuted than as an analysis of the situation. Consider that she said in 1999, this is the worry she had, Orthodox Jews would be compelled to give up the external insignia of their faith, Catholic hospitals and doctors forced to perform abortions on pain of punitive measures, and the Catholic Church forced to ordain women priests. All Christian schools and academies are force-fed some national agenda from which none is permitted to waver. These are interesting worries, and they have some possible hypothetical concern for us, but they seem misplaced in our culture today, where hostility to people to, of color on the part of the white majority is actually rising, where, and this is a quote from the Anti-Defense League, the number of anti-Semitic incidents was nearly 60% higher in 2017 than in 2016, and the largest single, that was the largest single year increase on record, and where white people have a 20 to one wealth advantage over black people, but they don't even know it. And where, while Americans overall are twice as likely to say there is more discrimination against Muslims than against Christians, the numbers are almost precisely reversed for white evangelical Protestants. Political thinking must begin from a cool appreciation of the actual facts on the ground before us, no matter what our ideologies invite us to perceive. I would submit that her judgments were sometimes misjudgments. When they appear, they emerged when she let the intensity of her concerns override the weight of the evidence that she could gather. This misjudgment, I think, was not just a failure of imagination, it's also a political failure in a way. She failed to see the possibilities of working with others across the differences that she had identified because of a misproportioned apprehension at times of the various challenges facing her moment. Her work was often governed more by an annoyance at what she saw as liberal and feminist pieties and platitudes than by an apprehension of what those pieties and platitudes were meant to oppose. She recognized the value and the imperative of including marginalized and oppressed voices in democratic deliberation, but she feared that the imperatives of liberal inclusion uh, dangerously suffocated other voices in the rush to right ancient wrongs. She saw the value she inhabited, she, in, she embodied the value of feminist impulses, but she also worried about the corrosive effects of what she saw as some forms of a trajectory in feminism towards androgyny 
in a way that would corrode, she feared, the civic and human value of institutions like the family. But she failed to realize, I think, that her aggrieved indignation at people down the hall should not eclipse her alarm at the people marching with torches in the streets. To confuse these is, perhaps, a pathology not without precedent in the precincts of the, of, of the academy. Uh, last year, I read Fritz Ringer's book, The Decline of the German Mandarins, the German Academic Community, 1890 to 1933, and I really wished that Jean had been around to talk to about it. I would recommend it to all of you as well. To be honest, I hope the concern this book wrote, rose with me never goes away. I wish that if Jean had read the book, um, we had had the chance to talk about it. I bet she did, and I'm sad that I never got to talk to her. Now, a touchy defender of Elstein on all this, and I can easily be one of Jean's touchy defenders, might reply that this analysis holds her to an impossible standard. Aren't all of us understandably provoked by our most proximate interlocutors? Anybody who has been in a faculty meeting would immediately affirm this. And let's be honest, the triumphant and self-regarding elitist liberalism of the 80s and 90s, which we now call neoliberalism, was certainly provocative. To borrow from David Cameron, they used to be the future once. In those days, liberalism was not mocked by Bernie bros and the hipster avant-garde in the nation. They were too busy trying to join it. Surely the suffocating self-congratulatory smugness of those thinkers deserved a kick in the pants. Perhaps there is something to this. A gadfly role can be a useful one. Certainly those thinkers were not the easiest to get along with. Undoubtedly, they were cluelessly intolerant of religious voices and glibly unwilling to listen to counterpositions. It took a while for the critics of liberalism to be heard as something other than either covert Nazis, empty-headed evangelical Reaganites, or dismissed as reactionary guerrillas for a, a countercultural Roman Catholic Church. But in fact, it was possible to have her assessment of the world and not aim one's fire wholly at those nearby who annoyed you. It was possible even in those days to keep your eyes more firmly on the real dangers. Thinkers like Susan Muller Okin offered searching critiques of Rawlsian liberalism without suggesting that the project as a whole could be bankrupt. An even more generally appropriate example of this is Elstein's friend Charles Taylor, a thinker who never thought that the dominant liberalism of the age was wholly adequate to a human condition, but also never thought it was a disaster that needed to be expunged. And since the turn of the millennium, others have surprisingly shown up with offering an analogous efforts, albeit from very different perspectives. Consider the recent turn to religion in the writings of thinkers such as Jürgen Habermas, and even, hold your, clutch, clutch your pearls at this point, Judith Butler. Um, the cosmopolitan uh, Paul Gilroy is another figure who does this as well. In all this, there are real lessons for us, negative and positive ones. Positively, we must strive to do what Jean did, to keep reminding ourselves of the value of the breadth of perception and the agility of imagination and empathy that is needed in the political task. We must struggle to let our vision range widely across the whole world and deep into multiple resources and always to keep a sense of proportion. Inevitably, Elstein failed at times to live up to her own high standards. Perhaps we should allow that it was admirable to have had these standards at all in the first place. Few of us managed them. Furthermore, her insistence on the ways that the petty concerns of academics could distort their apprehension of the world is still very valid, even if it applies to her own work at times. In her presence, one felt the pressure of an intellect probing persistently across the whole spectrum of issues that must be addressed in political thinking. She was not so much a political philosopher, I say, as a political thinker, one who brought to reflective self-awareness a much more adequate breadth of challenges for anyone thinking about politics than most of her colleagues could ever imagine in things like political science. Never monocausal, never reductionist, never constrained by a single idiom or vocabulary, she tried in her mental fencing bouts with interlocutors, whomever they might be, to get them to see how much more complicated and implicated in manifold issues were the political matters they thought they had successfully managed to isolate and address. I suppose it is no vast surprise that the principles that led her to engage so seriously with so wide a range of resources and thinkers would inevitably, from time to time, slip. And that's the negative lesson. 
we have to recognize that true political thinking of this sort is much, much harder than we normally admit. Elstein's own all-too-human failure to realize her best ideals is exemplary here. She was in so many ways a remarkable thinker, patient, engaged in serious, abiding work with the thinkers and topics she chose to engage, insisting on thinking with them in dialogue, letting them have their say and digesting it before answering back. I admire many of Elstein's monographs, Public Man, Private Woman, Sovereignty, Augustine and the Limits of Politics, but I actually think of her best as an essayist, as someone engaged in the thinking about politics on the ground as an ongoing conversation, wanting to manifest that conversation in her own work. She spoke in what she once called, borrowing from A.O. Hirschman, the horizontal voice, the right to address others, to call forth some sort of we, through the power of words shared among people committed to a common project. But that is also to say she was at her best at the genre at which most people are at their worst. For all of our professed interest in conversation, most of us are specialists in monologue. The trick about politics, this suggests, is simply that it is not something we naturally engage in at all. And yet we must engage in it, and ever more so, in the present moment and in years to come. The multiple crises we face are still in their early days. Both of their main waves are looming on our horizon ahead. We are not yet in their wake. I hope Elstein's failures, as well as her successes, her life and her thought and her words and her deeds, can serve as one small contribution to that larger human task. I deeply believe they can, for we will need all the help we can get. Thank you. And please join me in welcoming Deborah Erickson to the podium. Good morning. It falls to me to attempt to tie together and draw out some themes for further discussion from our panelists' excellent commentary. And I'm going to do this briefly, both uh, to leave time for discussion and also because I'm been battling a cold. All of our panelists, in one way or another, commented on Elstein's method. Her approach to her subject matter was distinctive and is part of the reason that her scholarship has been so difficult to categorize. I'm going to start with a brief um, summary and then a couple of questions for each of our panelists. Victor Anderson contrasted Elstein's village ideal for politics with his own rooted cosmopolitan perspective. He suggested that this led her to place certain institutions like family and church at the center of her approach to politics. James Turner Johnson directed our attention to Elstein's use of broad themes rather than granular detail in her work in contrast to his own more bottom-up approach to similar topics. Although here I note that Elstein began her graduate study in medieval history before switching to politics as a response to President Kennedy's call to public service. Robin Levin described Elstein's Augustinianism, which now seems out of step with the times. Um, it, in Levin's description um, of Elstein's place in contemporary discourse. Um, it leads us to a kind of, uh, originally a kind of pessimism about politics, but in contrast to today, almost optimistic. And last, Charles Matthews commented that at times, Elstein may have directed her attention too much on her peers in the academy, and not sufficiently to what was happening on the ground, causing her to miss some uh, both serious moral and political challenges and also missing connections with potential allies. These descriptions are in tension with Elstein's own view of her method, as she saw herself always looking more to real life than to theory. And she often expressed her disapproval at academics who flew so high or worked at such a level of abstraction that they missed the significance of the mundane activities of daily life. She did, after all, title one of her books, Real Politics, at the Center of Everyday Life. This is also the woman who went to sit, listen to, and bear witness to the Argentine mothers of the disappeared, an experience that profoundly affected her thinking about politics. When one reads across Elstein's body of work, one sees clearly that she had favorites, 
thinkers with whom she felt a kinship, because they grasped something true. But as Levin and Johnson suggest, her concern in appealing to these thinkers was not to excavate their work at a minute level, such as identifying their influences or getting caught up in variant readings of these thinkers. Rather, she picked up on a central theme or thrust in their work which she thought captured something profound about our human condition, whether in its perennial or contemporary form. And she used that to illuminate some aspect of her debate or issue that had been overlooked. Was Elstein a person of her era? Yes, I think so. And I think there's work to be done to examine exactly how she fit into the scope of late 20th century and early 21st century political thought. Was she unique? Again, I think, and as you have heard, the answer is in the affirmative. Elstein refused categorization, and she turned her formidable powers wherever she thought she could sort out woolly thinking and evasive wordplay. So now I want to pose some questions directly to our panelists, sort of comment questions, as is often the case. <laughs> um, for Victor Anderson, Elstein's village ideal in your rooted or liberal cosmopolitanism as approaches did not actually sound to me opposed so much as complementary. Converging, I think, in your approach to politics as provisional, as a way of dealing with or sorting out differences between competing groups or individual interests. And I thought here particularly of Jane Jacobs' famous account of city life in New York, which actually sounds a lot like life in a village, where people know their neighbors and where they are not lost in the anonymity of an urban setting, but rather create street-level community block by block. I also wonder whether Elstein's reflection on her childhood in Timnath was not so much an exercise in nostalgia as a Tocquevillian description of thick democracy rather than the thin democracy of the plebiscite. And I don't think that's what you were describing either. <clears throat> so I was wondering where you might see points of connection in her emphasis on localism and particularly in her ins insistence that all political solutions are necessarily partial, requiring negotiation and compromise. For Jim Johnson, given your long history with Jean and the close relationship between the areas in which you have both published, I wanted to know if there's one area of Elstein's work that you think should be revisited, one in particular. Where would we start? Um, and here I'm thinking more specifically, if I was going to pose one question, what, what do you think is the status of her book, Just War Against Terror, 17 years after the war that book talked about has um, started? And next for Robin Levin. Elstein believed in democracy, and she also believed in politics. Um, I remember that in 2010, when the Tea Party first made it onto the political scene, to the horror of many watchers in the academy, Elstein approved of what she saw as its grassroots democratic character. Of course, we now have the advantage of five more years of hindsight, and I do wonder what Elstein would have made of the 2016 election. It seems to me that what we are seeing now is not so much politics as anti-politics. People who are not able to win through fair elections and democratic processes seek to subvert those processes. I find Trump an inex inexcusable and a threat to democracy because of what I learned from Jean. But I wonder now whether she would agree with me. So I guess I want to know what you might think. And uh, finally, for Chuck, um, in your remarks, it seems to me uh, the piece of work that you were most referring to or most, might be most relevant to your remarks was Jean's Democracy on Trial. And in that book, one of her central concerns had to do with pluralism and the inadequacy of identity politics as a response to pluralism. So I wonder here, what do you think about this analysis in our current political climate? Was she right to worry? And uh, in the preface of that book, she talks about how she has joined the ranks of the nervous. So should we still be nervous about those themes that she raised in Democracy on Trial? Um, so in my brief uh, comments here, you can see, and from what was <laughs> discussed earlier, there's much to talk about. And I look forward to the conversation with our panel. Thank you. So I'd like to open it now for the panel, both to respond to Deborah's comments and to raise any further questions you may have that came from our presentations. You talk about uh, Jean's uh, thinking about uh, policy. She and I had a lot of agreements about the things that was troubled us about our culture, our moral culture. <laughs> 
I had my greatest disagreements with Jean about her over, what I call it, overzealous, uh, uh, near dogmatism about uh, rights talk. I agreed with her about uh, we, that our moral culture that we have was insufficient for uh, cultivating the kinds of civic virtues that she really espoused to, and I, don't, I can't find anybody who would disagree with those, that, 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 that point of view. But too many people, uh, the family that she imagined is not the family that many people whom she loved lived. So when you talk about the lived experience of the family, that was not my experience. And there's many ways in which her idealized family just didn't match two thirds of the world that she loved. I mean, this is the ambiguity in dealing with Jean uh, with, with regard to the people she loved most, how she idealized the solution, just was not their lived situation. And so rights talks was, only, was, was the only avenue many of us had to get out of the kind of village mor morality uh, that kept many of us bound into very bad and abusive situations that were hidden in silence. My, my disagreements and conversation with Jean was really about she was not opposed to rights as such because she had a profound sense about uh, hum her humanism was wide. She cared a great deal about global, global rights. She cared a great deal about human rights. But it's when she, was, when she translated uh, the, the, the private rights, the, the privacy uh, becoming political, it, it, that troubled me. It is the case that when children are abused in their homes and the churches sustain them, her confidence in churches I just didn't share. Her confidence in families I didn't share. I am a, I am a, I am a, I am a survivor of, of family abuse. And so when I'm reading her, there's an existential level. Where I needed something more in my conversation. I, rights Talks gave me a point of transcendence from the embedded world uh, that formed uh, Jean's understanding of the political. And so it wasn't, I, my, uh, my cosmopolitanism was ought not to be seen as oppositional to what Jean cared for. It's just that Jean's limited politics is just too limited for the kind of social political realities that too many people have to transcend. And that's really never where, 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 where I, our disagreements uh, lay with regard to a kind of rooted cosmopolitanism. I can share it with Jean, much of her, her what, what she worried about, but her limited politics is just too limited for the majority of the world's people and the poor that she cared about and which civic rights of marriage, family, and different kinds of families is emerging and are the realities of too many people over against her very limited understanding of the nuclear family. That's really where I was coming from. In thinking about the, uh, what I would say about her attitude, uh, attitudes as expressed in Just War Against Terror, I, uh, I, I reflect on the, uh, the experience I had in the years after the 9-11 attacks and after the appearance of her book. When I used to assign the book <clears throat> as a, uh, a reading, uh, one, of, one of two uh, choices that my, the students in my war course could, uh, could take to uh, read and, and write a paper on it. And this, this, of the students that chose to read Just War Against Terror and write their book, or write their uh, papers on that, um, a, an, an interesting number of them uh, were very critical of the position that, that they saw her as taking there. And in particular, they were uh, critical of her, uh, of the uh, implications of her argument for the war in Iraq. I have often wondered, I wondered at the time, and I've often wondered since, uh, how, <clears throat> how many of the critics 
uh, thought that it would have been a good thing to leave Saddam Hussein in place and how things might have come out differently had the Bush administration done a more responsible job in planning for the reconstruction of Iraq after the removal of Saddam. But that uh, was not to be, of course, and, and was not. I, I still think that the outcome is something that is only going to need to be viewed from a very long view. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a messy situation all in all, and it's hard to make judgments about it purely in hindsight based on a, pers a particular perspective at a given time. But I think Gene's, uh, Gene's judgments on this had to do with the whole notion of political responsibility that I mentioned in, in my talk earlier and uh, the uh, idea of sovereign responsibility as connected to the ideals of justice in just war theory and also uh, in her understanding of the ideal of sovereignty as uh, a, a, a form of, uh, of political leadership in which one expresses a certain responsibility for the overall community and its good, as well as for the overall political environment in which that community is located. <coughs> if one judges her position in just war against terror by focusing on that, it seems to me that one comes out in a rather different place than if you focus on a purely post hoc uh, judgment about the way things have developed since then. Her perspective did not guarantee that there would always be pragmatically good results. And that's one of the problems with a uh, a, a position based in a, uh, a moral judgment that is always inherently fallible. It's a judgment that, <clears throat> that uh, it seems to me can be learned from and used to inform future judgments. And that's part of the whole uh, benefit of revisiting past judgments. But it requires a real sense of history to do this. And that's a sense of history that many of us in this country unfortunately find difficult to reach or to sustain if we do reach it. Well, the, the question I take it in, in summary is, you know, what would Gene Elstein make of the politics that we have today, which you described as a kind of anti-politics? And, and it, so let me first take a view on that, and, and then I think I can uh, res try to respond from an Elstein <laughs> perspective. <laughs> it is true that our politics today is, is in some kind of a crisis. Uh, the crisis, to my mind, has to do with the idea that, that politics has become almost entirely about getting elected and the mechanics of, uh, that you go through in order to, to get elected. Uh, and most politicians today haven't the slightest idea of what they're supposed to do next uh, <laughs> after the election, right? So, and, and part of that is because the electoral process seems no longer about setting up a candidate who represents a position and holds some views to which you might persuade an electorate. Maybe that was always an idealized view of, of what elections were about. But clearly today, it's a matter of identifying demographics and then manipulating the, uh, el the electoral boundaries and so forth to uh, in, in, you know, get the desired results at the polls. Getting elected you know, is, is a matter of how well you manage the electoral process. Now, 
in one way, that's not an anti-politics at all. That's people taking politics very seriously and at a very local level. Where I live in Chicago, congressional districts, you can see, have been drawn to take in or exclude particular apartment buildings. Uh, that's village politics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't want to say that that is in itself an anti-politics, but it's, it, it's politics shaped by the idea that once we are elected, everything will be fine. Well, of course, what, what happens is then the, uh, the electorate is polarized, so that you have sharply divided political positions separated by fractions of a percentage point uh, in, the, in the electoral process. And instead of governing, as soon as you get elected, you start concentrating on winning the next election. I, I, I mean, this is simply a recipe for dysfunction and we're all experiencing it. It's astonishing how rapidly this has happened and to have this discussion uh, and think about Jean and how she would have would have viewed such a thing is a, is a reminder of just how how rapidly the the situation has deteriorated. It's precisely because Jean Elstein was interested in real politics and not just in managing demographics that uh, that I think she would be appalled by where we find ourselves today. Uh, and I, I think the other thing that is, uh, is obvious about that and that kind of unites us across the spectrum of approaches here, as, as Jim pointed out, uh, our, the, the difference between the top down and bottom up approach both is, is really important and it shapes some serious differences in the way we approach these kinds of political questions. But whether you're working top down or bottom up, we've all got an eye on history. And as I tried to suggest at the end of, of my presentation, a, a fundamental change of perspective that I, I simply think Gene would, would never, uh, uh, you know, would, have, would be speaking out against is, you know, that, that we are now focused entirely on interest in the present with no view to the past. And the only consequences we're concerned about are those who are that, are, that are going to be experienced by the voters today. That's not politics the way Tocqueville <laughs> or uh, Augustine thought about it. And, uh, and, and we've, we've got a real problem figuring out how, how to reintroduce some of these ideas into the broader public discourse. I think that a lot of um, nice, decent, right-thinking white liberals like myself um, grew up uh, drinking in uh, a, a, a dream of a colorblind society with our mother's milk. And I think, um, the last 10 to 15 years has really um, uh, disenthralled me of the usefulness of that politically to understand our world. Um, because the, it's clearly not colorblind and it's uh, only uh, the colorblind white liberals who have been blind to color. Um, uh, the rest of the white population has known all along that color matters and people of color don't need to be told that either. So uh, I think if there's an interesting worry about identity politics, um, as I'm trying to make sense of that category, and I think it's a good worry in some ways, it's the idea of the illegitimate intrusion of improper features of human beings or persons into politics that ought not to be introduced into politics, that in some ways contaminate it or uh, confuse it. Uh, uh, it definitely appears in Democracy on Trial. The other place I found it in Jean uh, most interestingly engaged is in her little essay, Political Children on Arendt's Reflections on Little Rock. She was very much a Tocquevillian. She was also, I think, very thoroughly an Arendtian, and I think that's a dimension of her that is, um, is, is very, very much resonates with a number of us. Um, 
And in uh, Political Children, I actually was pleased to see, I, I went back to reread it uh, in light of this panel and, and, and found that actually she, she does identify the, the, the blindnesses that Arendt suffers from um, and that um, uh, uh, she was called out for uh, by critics at that, at that time in the reflections on the Little, Little Rock debate. Um, but look, if identity politics is the illegitimate intrusion of improper features of humanity into politics, I would say that in American politics at least, and I think actually in, in European politics you see this quite clearly as well, and probably elsewhere around the world, I won't speak to that, race and other identities are just facts of our politics that have in fact always shaped our politics and continue to shape them. Um, and to deny that is to deny um, the three-fifths clause in the Constitution. I mean, it's, it's like how much more literal do we need to be to put race in, but to put it in the founding document of, of the nation. Um, so that's one thing, it's just that identity is there and it's a politically operative fact. Furthermore, I think the most powerful identity politics, at least in American politics today, and I would also say in the UK politics, is white identity politics which we never seem to notice is an identity politics of its own uh, because we code it as normal or de-adjectivalized or unhyphenated. But in fact, it is a thoroughly distinctive identity politics. And I would say that uh, its most recent example is the election of Donald Trump in 2016, where a large fraction of white America decided it was better to try, as the Southern um, secessionists said in, 18, in the 1850s, it was better to try to pull the temple down than to actually share the goods of a common nation with other people in this way. Um, and so I think the idea that we wanna worry about identity politics, A, on the one hand, you're right, we need to worry about it, but B, um, we don't need to keep it out, it is already here. <laughs> so that would be where I would go. And I think actually, um, Jean would, in the move from Democracy on Trial through political children, I think there's some possibility that um, there's some space in her thinking to, to think about that. But that's all. So. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome some time now for question or comment, friendly or otherwise, um, <laughs> from the audience here. I do ask, though, um, for the sake of uh, others who would also have questions to try and keep our comments brief. Thank you. Turn over on the right. Sure. Good morning. Can <clears throat> you hear me all right? I want to uh, address particularly uh, <clears throat> Charles Matthews' comment that <clears throat> Jean's uh, prediction in 1999 about a growing hegemony of a certain kind of liberal correctness um, seems to be radically uh, off the mark in 2018, if I understood you correctly. Um, but it seems to me that a historical perspective here in a couple of different dimensions uh, would be worth thinking about that a little bit more. I wonder if um, you've been traumatized so much by what happened in 2016 that it's, it's sort of all we can look at. Um, I would suggest in, in a couple, in two respects, wondered about your response to this. First, um, if we went back behind 2016, if we looked at Barack Obama's administration and the trajectory of his social policies and the way he was pressing a pretty unapologetic liberal agenda as Americans define liberal. Um, I wonder if she in 2015 would have looked pretty prescient and said, yeah, you know what? This is in fact an encroaching form of hegemony on various kinds of religious institutions. So I wonder if it's the, it's the Trump backlash that has seemingly disconfirmed that, but with, in a broader historical view, another few years from now, we may see something else. So I wonder how you'd feel about that if you, if you went back to 2015 and just tried not to think about Donald Trump for a minute, which I find to be always good advice. <laughs> the second kind of historical comparison, it seems to me, is if I may, we are at the American Academy of Religion, but if we get out of America in our minds just a little bit, if we went just a little bit north, when Canadians passed same-sex marriage in our federal parliament, there was 
uh, in typical Canadian terms, a kinder, gentler backlash <laughs> with two minority conservative governments and then finally majority conservative government. But it was definitely response, the demographics are clear, definitely response to what many Canadians felt to be going too quickly, too, uh, too uh, much in, a, in an aggressive liberal agenda as they saw it, as we saw it. Now, under um, the, uh, Trudeau the Younger, <coughs> we're seeing a pretty naked, pretty confident hegemony of, uh, of a kind of almost blithely uh, obvious intuitive sense of what's right. And he just does things that he thinks are right. And, and he's quite confident that all right thinking people agree with him. And to a, a very drastic curtailment of a religious difference and freedom in Canada, which I think in some ways is paralleled by developments in Australia. When I was studying American culture at the University of Chicago, I was, I was constantly struck by how Americans seemed completely unaware of the two cultures that I think are most, typical, most similar to America, namely Canada and Australia. And yet in those two very similar countries, both in a sense New World, both Anglo, both post-colonial in some ways, we see in fact, I think, a fairly steady arc toward what President Obama would call justice and what Jean might have said, a particular form of justice that may not be all that just to other people. I wonder what you think about looking at it in that way. Thank you. So you didn't actually bring up the law school case in Western Canada, which is a fascinating one as well. I think there's a lot of empirical uh, issues to look at on the two dimensions you're talking about. Um, my claim was, and just to make it a little easier for me to defend myself, um, that not that it was radically off the mark, but that it was a misapprehension of what are the real dangers here. Um, I don't know how Trudeau has interacted with the Supreme Court of Canada on this, but my, my interest actually is in um, religious freedom issues around Quebec, um, and especially around the Sikh and the Muslim communities in um, a very intolerant French nationalist community in Quebec. That would actually be, I think, a larger infringement. Um, if the worry is uh, that conservative evangelical Protestants in Canada um, uh, do not want to participate in, situ in social situations where other people who they are not even related to can get married to people of the same sex. I, I, there would, there's a larger argument there about exactly what is the injury that those conservative evangelical Protestants are suffering from. And you and I, we know, you know, and there's a larger literature and religion in America on what exactly the nature of that injury is. The Obama issue is a really interesting one. Anyone who worked with the people in that administration um, and this is uh, including people uh, like Russell Moore, who uh, is a Southern Baptist a religious liberty figure who uh, was just at UVA uh, two weeks ago, um, will tell you that there was actually a quite serious attempt to try to negotiate this. And at one point, I think it's going to be fascinating to see the full history of the debates between uh, the legal counsel in the White House, the Obama White House, um, and the various Catholic organizations around Obamacare and the degree to which they tried to work out a compromise around what exactly would be forced to, the, 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 the churches would be forced to do. Um, it finally came down to writing a letter um, and finding the letter and mailing it um, to say that we don't, we don't want to do this. And that was what they were, and, and so at that point, once we get clarity on what exactly was the nature of the compulsion, then I'm happy to have a public debate about whether or not that compulsion actually amounts to religious tyranny. One last thing, I would say, it is not just 2016 that um, uh, radicalized me. Um, uh, I am from Charlottesville, and um, uh, we have had multiple events where um, uh, people have come and expressed religious liberty in a very unliberal way. And um, I'm, I'm alert to the fact that um, my, my colleagues who are Jews in Charlottesville, uh, as well as Muslims, um, and many Christians of multiple colors um, have felt deeply threatened uh, by things that this administration, unlike any previous Republican administration or Democratic administration, um, has not roundly and univocally, univocally condemned. So that's my, so again, it's about the estimation of what the weights are. I'm actually more comfortable with someone like Doug Laycock, who's a scholar, who, uh, a legal scholar who I know and respect a lot, who worries about some of the directions of um, some of the Democratic, uh, con Democratic Party's uh, legal strategies on this. Uh, but clearly that strikes me as not the kind of tsunami that we're now seeing um, with 
people who actually dress up like Nazis marching in the streets of America with torches and saying, Jews will not replace us, right? That seems like a new thing. Uh, I want to thank the panel. I'm Mark Douglas. I teach at Columbia Seminary in Atlanta. Um, I grew up in Timnath, Colorado, a generation after Gene Elstein did. Uh, I started Timnath Elementary about the same time she started Colorado State University. My family, uh, longtime members of Timnath Presbyterian Church, the only church in town. Um, the church wasn't much bigger then, and the city wasn't much bigger than when I was there. Um, the Bethkeys did not go to Timnath Presbyterian Church because it was Presbyterian, although that meant kind of it was broad denominationally Protestant. Um, Lutherans, they went into town. I think they went into Fort Collins. I think Gene told me that. Um, there's a romanticism of Timnath in Gene's work that is belied by the experiences of those of us who grew up in Timnath, because Timnath is just a couple miles east of and across the interstate from Fort Collins, where there's a research university and where there's a lot of kind of more cosmopolitan sensibility. Um, this odd kind of romanticism and realism that I kind of find pervading Gene's work from beginning to end is for me kind of both a signal of what made her distinct, right? Uh, it's a, it shaped a vision that was unique in the academy. It shaped a motivation that led her to get engaged in social issues. It shaped a perspective that was kind of a combative, common sense, dem dem democratic sensibility. Um, these two things are always linked in her work to me. And I wonder, um, they're both the cause of what is most attractive in her work and the cause that sometimes is most repelling to me in her work. If the question the panel was asked is kind of what, what, we, what she got right and what she got wrong, I wonder if those two are so intricately linked that we couldn't separate them out with losing Elstein entirely. So my first question is, um, can we separate out kind of what she got right and what she got wrong? Um, and the second question that kind of follows from that, and maybe this is red meat for Chuck, is um, how Augustinian is that actual vision as it plays itself out over time in her work? I, I really appreciate uh, the question because uh, I really, my point, my point in my paper is moral optics matter. How we see things, that scene is not necessarily, may lead to believing, but the believing may be uh, off site. And that is uh, our fears, our frustrations in our life may make us turn back to the comforts of another time, another memory, and also remembering things that may not be what they were. Gene did have, and this is, this is a complexity dealing with, Gene had this longing for a culture that could do all these things that she really wanted to happen, to see happening. But she was also a realist. So it's, as much as she could talk about the comfort of home and all the, all the other stuff, she also understood about backbiting, gossiping, all the other stuff that come, becomes part of the village. I think when you take a metaphor and make it an ontological entity that be, almost become metaphysically the way we organize our political and moral world around it, it's the question of what gets screened into that vision and what gets screened out. And what's screened out are often the things that uh, she feared the most. She feared most the intrusion of states' sovereignty into that sphere that was so, so wonderful, comforting, private. But what got screened out is that for so many other people, it is the thing that she prized so much was, so, was not a place of safety. Our families were not always a place of safety. Our neighborhoods were not always cooperating. There wasn't always peace and comfort. So it's that tension in, in Jean's moral vision that I think uh, draws many of us to her, but also make us do like this. Understand that the sense of belonging is important. But when you take a metaphor of the village and you make it an ontological symbol, it screens some things in rightly, but it screens an awful lot out wrongly. So I think we have to live with the kind of tension of what we prefer, our aspirations, 
and the reality that is given us in lived experience. I, my point was that Gene's limited politics is just too limited for the kind of world we inhabit that's much wider, complex, that her vision may not be the most adequate one for understanding that complexity. I especially like those two questions you posed at the end, one about the, how to judge her right and wrong, and the other how to judge her Augustinianism. I think that, the, that what I would say about whether we, can, whether we judge her right or wrong is that that always will depend on our own perspective and our own context. There is a, a certain ability to, uh, to find rightness and wrongness of a more absolute sort in less complex thinkers than Jean was. Uh, she was a complex thinker, and she was fundamentally, I think, a moral thinker. And uh, disagreeing with other people's moral judgments is simply part of living one's own moral life. So I, uh, I think there is a kind of ambiguity there that uh, is, is hard to fix uh, in uh, black and white terms once and for all. As to the matter of, of the degree to which she was Augustinian, Robin may disagree with me on this, but I would say that certainly in detailed terms, she wasn't very Augustinian at all. She was Augustinian in the way that Protestants of her generation were Augustinian. And this was very much a big picture way. It was a way that accorded with the, uh, the values in the Protestant theological and religious culture of that period. And it was a way that, uh, that had its own way of, of uh, shaping uh, one's commentary upon the political life of the country. But if one thinks about <clears throat> the details of Augustine's own position, that would require reading all of his books. And what one finds there is a great deal more complex than what was in this Protestant understanding of Augustine. And it also would require taking account of the fact that after Augustine died, the way that his thought was transmitted forward for the next several hundred years into the high Middle Ages was through the collections of canons or, or uh, little excerpts uh, picked out for their value in, uh, in guiding the penitential, guiding how to live without sin uh, and that, uh, that this gives a, uh, a very particular view of Augustine that is radically different from this way of viewing Augustine that emerged in Protestant culture in the, the, the 50s and the 60s. Uh, in Just War Thinking, which I've written on in particular, the, the, uh, the various canons that, Augustine, that are ascribed to Augustine that um, defined the idea of just war in the Middle Ages uh, do not come from City of God Book One or the Confessions, which are the, uh, the go-tos for this culture of understanding Augustine that, uh, er that emerged in our own lifetimes, or in my lifetime at least. Uh, this is a very different way of thinking about it. And that, uh, that, is, uh, that signals to us, I think, that someone who approaches Augustine by looking at those sources is not going to be Augustinian in the same sense as previous generations were, and maybe not even in the sense that Augustine himself was. And just to uh, respond, it, it, I actually agree with, with Jim's characterization here. You know, I, I think that one of the things that has happened over the last couple of uh, uh, generations in Christian ethics is that we've really started reading those sources. Mm -hmm. Jim is one of the people who has, you know, has kind of made us all do that. Uh, and at the same time, I want to defend the top-down political theorist approach uh, <laughs> that, that was, uh, was, was described there. Uh, in, including the, the contribution that Augustine, and especially Augustine in the City of God, makes to understanding 
contemporary limited political problems in an eschatological and trans-historical uh, context. That, that to me is, is a genuinely Augustinian vision that, that people like Jean have tried to make relevant to our, our present time. And that, I guess, gets back to the question about what's right and, and what's wrong. With due regard for, for the uh, folks who put the panel together for us, I'm starting to realize that, that the relevant question here is how are our times different from or similar to the, the place where, where these questions are, are being raised? So that's obviously a huge question when you turn to Augustine. And at, this, at the same time, it, it is, given the rapid pace of current change, a, a highly relevant question when we start asking, was Gene right or wrong about this or that? Um, for the sake of time, I suggest that uh, we take the last two questions simultaneously and briefly, and we may have time, but if not, we'll always end sessions like this with more questions to walk away with. So please. Um, Hi, uh, John Carlson from Arizona State University. I want to thank all of you for your really, really thoughtful remarks. And um, just wanted to emphasize what may seem like a small point for some, but for, for a few of us who are in the audience, it's no small point at all, which is just the, the, the the deep love and nurturing that, that Jean provided to her students. Uh, she never wanted clones. She was always open and working to people with people who had very different views. And, and having worked with many of her students, uh, very few of us had projects like hers uh, un underway um, to our, our great sadness. They will probably never reach anything like that. Um, and one f final tribute on that mark on that point is is she nurtured us by getting us introduced to great networks of people. As I look at this panel, with the exception of Chuck, every single one of you are folks that I've met through Gene, uh, and I think that's just a and it's only because I met Chuck the, uh, before I. I thought you were excluding me from the great networks of people, <laughs> <laughs> you are, you which are would part of this. a sign of prudence on your part. But. Anyway, okay, so on on to my question here. Um, it's, a, it's a question from where we stand in this moment of time where we have now called something identitarian politics, which is a bit different than the, some of the early concerns of the 90s about identity politics that Jean talked about. Um, but I want to make a distinction here that I think she would have always understood was there's a different, she was always deeply under, uh, concerned with identity. So for all of her criticisms about identity politics, and I think you have rightly shown that in certain places she, she far overstated the concerns, particularly from where we stand today. Wow, if she was concerned about identity politics, what Chuck's talking about in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Charlottesville is far outweighs any concerns that she could have ever foreseen. She, she died before she saw that. That's also a bad form of civil society, too. <laughs> that is a very bad form of civil society. Um, but having said that, she is someone who, of course, was always concerned about her own identity of who she was. She spent, she went to great lengths to develop that, understanding that through prisms of, uh, of, of, uh, of gender, of religion. I've you've talked with her a bit about it in terms of disability and things of that nature. Uh, some of these things she was more forthcoming about in her own work. And not. So identity is not something that we can ever leave out of politics. I think what most concerned her was if we were to reform her thought, was not so much improper intrusion of certain features into political life, but uh, an undue monolithic approach to certain features in political life. And so that always had to be, it seems to me, rounded out by other forms of identity to which she spent a lot of time thinking about human identity, what does it mean to be human, how, are the, how do we form certain kinds of um, uh, 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 you know, common aspirations, common understandings uh, across cultures, so th through dialogue, through things like the humanities, an effort to actually understand the human condition, what makes us common, similar, 
in spite of all of our many, many differences. It was also, a, and, and I'm thinking here also about her, her love of films, the way in which films speak to the viewer in a way that is trying to, uh, trying to draw us all in, however diverse we are in that audience, to, to the storyline. And I'm also thinking about civic identity. And I'll get to the question here. So civic identity, of course, civil religion, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the other ways then that we can try to recover those things? Is human identity gone? Is civic identity gone? Great. And this will be our last comment. Hi, Laura Alexander, University of Nebraska at Omaha. I want to say thank you as well. Um, my question is, uh, we live in a state-centric system in a lot of ways. And there's on the one hand, there's kind of the worry that the state can be hegemonic. Um, and, and kind of overwhelm the type of local politics that we must do because all politics is local in a lot of ways. And we see what happens when we don't have those kinds of local politics um, that really function at least some kind of functional way. On the other hand, uh, we also encounter problems um, that seem not to be able to be addressed by a system of sovereign states. Um, climate change is probably the one that comes first to my mind, but the churning together of humanity that Chuck mentioned um, the, the issue of, of horrible treatments of migrants and so forth. Um, these seem to be problems that somehow have to be addressed at even a broader level or higher level than we can do in a system of sovereign states. Um, uh, so th there seems to be a way in which uh, the states that we, that we have that are they're trying to work together in some ways um, are unable to achieve the limited peace that Dr. Levin was talking about. I wonder if you could just pull out a couple of ideas or a couple of pieces of advice that you might see in Jean's work um, think through where we go with those sorts of problems. Thanks. And I'm afraid we'll have to take that into conversations outside of the panel now. Um, for the sake of our host, the ethics um, uh, area, the ethics group and the religion and politics group, um, we're going to be bringing this panel to a close to allow for their business meeting to have uh, the time that they need. Um, Jean had a deep love um, for Tin Math, uh, both romantic and real, and a deep love for Colorado. And um, the Elstein family is here, and they have actually, they're beginning to create a, a scholarship fund for students at uh, Colorado State University. Um, so Errol at the front has uh, more information with regards to that. Um, but what we saw here, I think, was a real tribute of love, if we understand love as Simone Weil called it, as attention. We saw a just and loving attention today um, to the work of Jean Elf Elstein. So please join me in thanking our panel for their um, great contribution.